Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage your conference chair, Anita Arnand. Good morning. Did we have a, a lovely evening? A lot of lovely networking going on. I was walking through the hall um, to leave yesterday and I saw great knots of very animated people. And I always think that at conference, those are the places actually where, where some of the most interesting things happen, the most interesting synergies. And you learn things that you wouldn't have expected. Um, I have a thing that I've learned that I wanted to share with you this morning. Um, some of you may have been in on the Jason Helgerson talk yesterday. Um, if you're just a show of hands, just so, who, who was here for the Helgerson thing? Oh, a lot of you. Yes, it was quite a full session. Um, and so, just for those who weren't, he is the head of Medicaid for New York. And while we were waiting, we have this little room at the back where we chat. Um, and I noticed on his CV that before he took over New York, he actually looked after something in Wisconsin called Badger Care Plus. It turns out that's the name of their Medicaid program in Wisconsin. And I said, well, why Badger Care? Because it really does sound like something Brian May should be involved in. Um, and he told me this brilliant fact. This is what I mean. I would never have known this had I not had that little pocket. Uh, he said that after Obamacare was introduced, the states all went with their national an animal. And that's what they named their programs after, which is a great fact, trivial pursuit. I like to win that game. However, I just suddenly noticed, I said, well, but you didn't. New York is still called New York Medicaid. Why is that? And he looked at his shoes and he said, um, that's because our state animal is the beaver. <laughs> <laughs> now, for those of you who don't get that joke, <laughs> Uh, it is not a joke, it is a fact, but I would talk to your colleagues in OBS and Gynae because it is quite literally their area of expertise. Um, <laughs> now, it is an extremely full house this morning, and uh, I'm not surprised. A full programme for you today, and we're starting with the biggie, if you like. Uh, a few weeks ago, the Secretary of State for Health said that uh, this would be his last big job in frontline politics. Now, now when he said that, he shook a few of my colleagues and, and shocked a, a few of his own. Because a, a while ago, this is a man who is being tipped as a possible shoe in at number 10. Um, so maybe, I don't know, the events of the last few months have been a little bit bruising. Uh, you can certainly say they have been eventful, which is why maybe this really is the last frontier for him. Despite getting a, a mandate in the election, we've seen the Secretary of State fighting fires in his own backyard. We've had uh, the House of Commons uh, Public Accounts Committee giving a very bleak assessment of the black hole in NHS finances. We've had uh, the questioning of the feasibility of this £22 billion efficiency saving by 2020. The King's Fund saying actually it is misleading the voters to say the NHS gets the sixth biggest increase in history. Um, new figures just out yesterday which won't help. Uh, NHS managers and senior doctors retiring with pension pots worth two million, that figure has apparently doubled. And all the while, the mood music about cuts, further cuts, tightenings of belts. And I haven't even come to the junior doctors strike. Now, I know, because some of you have come up to me and told me as much, that you're concerned about what the trajectory will be for the next three years. And I suspect that the Secretary of State will want to assure you that his is the hand you want on the tiller for these very important next three years. Very, very interested to hear what the Secretary of State has to say. Please put your hands together for the Secretary of State for Health, Mr Jeremy Hunt. Well, thank you, Anita, for uh, the, simply the most wonderful introduction I've ever had. I mean, not only did you list absolutely everything that's going wrong in the NHS at the moment, but you told me it was my last big job. Um, I uh, very much hope it is a big job that I do for a very, very long time. I'm sorry to disappoint you folks, um, but uh, I am delighted that you've invited me. As Anita alluded to, uh, this is not a year where I have scaled new peaks of popularity in the NHS. Um, and uh, I did think when Jeremy Corbyn was elected leader of the Labour Party that I might slide easily and quietly into being what, the less controversial Jeremy in British politics. 
but a glance at Twitter shows how dismally wrong I was. And um, in fact, uh, I did pick out a few highlights from Twitter, which um, I thought I might just share with you to get everyone going. Um, this one says, uh, this is obviously relating to the junior doctor strike, at Jeremy Hunt, you must have been born at the weekend. Apparently, that's when most accidents happen. <laughs> Um, uh, then uh, the singer James Blunt charmingly said, I'm officially handing over my Cockney rhyming title to at Jeremy Hunt. <laughs> and then, um, remember, there was a lot of debate about the use of statistics. Uh, we had at Jeremy Hunt, you better be careful about doing things on the weekend. If you fell and went to hospital, you'd definitely become a statistic. <laughs> Charming. I'm afraid the other comments weren't fit for a family audience like... Uh, Confed, but um, I do want to say this. It is an incredible privilege to do my job, just as I know for each and every one of you, you think it's an incredible privilege to do your job. Working as professionals in healthcare, we uniquely combine the leadership responsibility for large and complex organizations with the moral responsibility for people's lives, and I know none of us ever forget the trust the public put in us, or indeed the responsibility that goes with that trust. And that's what makes this occasion, but indeed all the other 362 days when we're on, on the NHS front line, so special to all of us. And I think one thing that we are all very aware of is the pressures right now on the NHS front line. And uh, we read about them in the media every day. It's absolutely right that the media do report them. Not only are we a democracy, but this is rightly top of the list of public concerns. But uh, sometimes those individual stories don't give the whole picture. And I just want this morning to spend a bit of time uh, taking a step back and looking at some of the achievements that we have done together in the NHS in recent years, uh, things of which I think we can be justifiably extremely proud. So let's start with uh, the disease that the public are most worried about, and that's cancer. We all knew several years ago that we were missing far too many cancers at the early stages. People were finding it difficult to get access to the latest cancer drugs and indeed they often weren't getting the latest cancer treatment. Let's have a look at what's changed over the last five years. So if you look at the number of diagnostic tests, the graph at the top there, they have increased by a staggering 16,000 tests every single day compared to just over five years ago. And that has meant that we are starting treatment for 130 more cancer patients every day than we were just a few years ago. Um, if you look at the, the latest radiotherapy treatment, uh, nearly half are now receiving intensity modulated radiotherapy treatment, which is much more accurate at targeting the tumors. Uh, we have 84,000 people who benefited from the Cancer Drugs Fund. And uh, Cancer Research UK say that those changes are saving about a thousand lives a month. And that is very impressive, but as I think everyone here recognises, we are still not the best amongst the leading European nations. We still have a long way to go, and that's why we are continuing to make huge changes in our cancer provision. Uh, as a government, we've legislated for standardised tobacco packaging. That started in April. We've had Sir Harpal Kumar's Cancer Task Force Plan, uh, which is going to um, bring in the new four-week uh, cancer waiting time standard from um, first appointment with a GP to uh, final diagnosis or the all clear. Um, we're going to be introducing molecular uh, diagnostic testing, which is even more accurate. And those between them will save an additional 30,000 lives a year. This is a big, big stepping up of our ability to treat the single biggest killer, the disease that most people care about. And we should be very proud of the progress being made there. Now, I, I want to pick the areas that people say are where we have the biggest problems. 
just to demonstrate why I think we are making important progress. So let me pick another one that regularly crops up where we absolutely do have a lot of challenges, and that is mental health. Now, mental health has always suffered under successive governments from being uh, the Cinderella service. It suffered from the fact that they've never had waiting times targets, which has sucked money into other parts of the NHS. And it's often been the first call for cuts when um, people have, have run out of money. And so there have always been issues there. But let's look at what has actually changed in mental health, again, over the last six years. If you look at talking therapies, which is, by the way, the new word for IAPT. We are officially banning IAPT because we think it's totally incomprehensible. But talking therapies is often the first line of treatment for people with depression, anxiety, and those conditions which, if we catch early, we can stop being a lifelong condition. In fact, the exciting thing about talking therapies is how high the total cure rates are. And we are now seeing three quarters of a million more people accessing talking therapies every year. There is a huge ramping up. If you look at dementia, um, another uh, illness which people have often not wanted to talk about, it's often had a lot of taboos around it, we have moved from diagnosis rates that were around international averages to the highest diagnosis rates that we can find measured anywhere in the world. We have a million dementia friends, second only, we think, to Japan. Uh, we are taking mental health as a whole, seeing every day 1,400 more people for mental health treatment than we were just five years ago. And on top of that, we've legislated for parity of a stream and we've introduced waiting times targets uh, for um, uh, psychosis, talking therapies and eating disorders. But again, we know that's not enough. Uh, the world has only just woken up to the power of effective mental health treatment. And so we've had the Mental Health Task Force Reform, brilliantly chaired by Paul Farmer, that is uh, proposing some more changes we can make, including a transformation of children and young people's mental health, which is still an area we need to do a lot of work on, plans to spend a billion more every year and indeed treat a million more patients every year. And on top of that, uh, in the next couple of months, NHS England will be publishing, this is the first time it's happening anywhere in the world, um, CCG by CCG Ofsted style rankings of the quality of mental health care so we can start to even out the variation. So really ambitious plans on mental health. Now let's take um, another one, which is uh, in the press perhaps, well, most weeks, and that is A&E. We are missing our a &E standard at the moment. We got to, we improved slightly uh, in the last month that was reported to 90%, but that is not 95%. And I know that is a, core, a source of disappointment to everyone here as it is to me, and we're gonna change that. And I'm absolutely determined that this is the year that we turn things around on a &E performance. Um, but if you look under the surface, we can see that there have been some very dramatic increases in both attendances and admissions. And that, that target of four hours, if you look at the number of people we actually treat within four hours in our a &E departments, it's about 60,000 a day. That has actually gone up by 2,500 people a day over the last six years. We've increased the number of consultants in a &E by 53%. The doctors overall are up by 26%. And at the same time, since 2012, we've had the, um, the reconfiguration of trauma care into 26 specialist trauma units, which have dramatically improved mortality rates for people who suffer a serious trauma and indeed uh, reduce the uh, amount of a lifelong harm and lifelong disability. So again, a lot of things happening there. And now let me um, talk about something that Anita's already mentioned, which is the issue of workforce morale. And I don't want to duck the issue that, you know, at the end of a, a year when we've had a very damaging and difficult industrial relations dispute, that of course takes its toll on morale. 
But that isn't the whole picture. If you, five years ago, worked at Wexham Park, you knew what the CQC subsequently told us, which was that the care there was unsafe. You knew that uh, the workforce was disempowered and disengaged. And the CQC described the culture there of, as of learned helplessness. Well, Wexham Park was one of 27 hospitals that we put into special measures. Um, it's one of 11 hospitals that came out of special measures following the extraordinary leadership of Sir Andrew Morris and his team at Frimley Park. And the CQC's view is about Wexham Park is that there's been a culture shift. They note that the proportion, the staff, the proportion of staff who would recommend that trust as somewhere for their own family to be treated has increased from less than half to more than two thirds. And of their eight core areas, whereas before six of the eight were inadequate, now all eight are good or outstanding. That is an extraordinary turnaround. And in fact, what happened at Wexham Park is a reflection of something broader that I think has happened across the NHS, which is a truly remarkable response to the tragedy of what happened at Midstaffs. We could have buried our heads in the sand. We could have said, this is just something that's happened at an isolated hospital. It's nothing to do with me. No one said that. And the result of that is that we see an NHS which is, despite the fact that we're doing 4,500 more operations every single day, the proportion of patients being harmed in hospitals is down by a third, according to the Health Foundation. And um, that, of course, has an impact on employee morale. If you look at the NHS staff survey, uh, despite all the pressures that we know about, the overall staff engagement has been going up, the number of staff recommending their own organisation as a place to work or receive treatment has been going up, staff satisfaction with the level of their level of responsibility and involvement has been going up, and the feeling of satisfaction in terms of the support they get from their immediate managers has also been going up. Now, there is lots to do. And I want to mention two things in particular where I think we can all do better in terms of staff engagement. One is we are still getting far too many stories about bullying that's happening. The NHS uh, has shockingly high numbers of staff who say they're bullied. And we still don't have across the board, although we have some outstanding exceptions to this, a culture where people feel comfortable about talking about things where they may have made a mistake or they may have seen clinical mistakes amongst their immediate team. And we will never, um, never become the world's largest learning organization, which is my aspiration, unless we make it easier for people to speak out if they feel that things have gone wrong or indeed if they may have been responsible for things that have gone wrong. So that's an important cultural change. But there's a second change, which I think is something that I have understood as a result of the, the junior doctor's strike. And it's something very practical, which I think uh, you can help with as well. And that is that one of, well, many of the frustrations of the junior doctor workforce who are amongst our hardest working staff in the NHS relate to things that aren't directly in the contract but around the inflexibilities in their training and the inflexibilities in their rostering. And I want to set a challenge for the NHS. If you look at the most modern e-rostering systems that airlines like British Airways use, they make it really easy for people to bid for hours that are convenient for them. Maybe it's someone who um, wants to work longer hours in term time and shorter hours in the school holiday or needs to finish at a certain time of the day because they have a a parent or grandparent with dementia that they're looking after. They make it easy for their staff. And this is not just good for staff, it's good for patients uh, because you have better motivated staff, but also it's good for our balance sheets because if our rostering systems are inflexible, then of course people want to become locums or work for agencies which can offer high levels of flexibility. And so we need to look very carefully. There are hospitals like Plymouth, Addenbrookes, South Tees that have done a fantastic job. You've all got e-rostering systems, but the truth is that many people aren't using them. And indeed, some people 
are uh, actually uh, doing their rostering on paper and then simply recording them on an e-rostering system so that they can print out electronic charts. But actually, that's not how a good e-rostering system should work. So that's something where we can do better. Now, I've shown some slides where I think we can be proud of progress that's being made. But I want to put up a more challenging slide uh, because I still think there is a lot to do, a lot to do when it comes to patient safety. Uh, we still have uh, two examples of wrong site surgery every week across the NHS, two examples of foreign objects left in people's bodies every week. We still, according to the Hogan and Black analysis, have 150 avoidable deaths every week. And we still have, according to the Fremantle study, a weekend effect, which sees mortality rates for weekend admissions around 15% higher. Now, I know there's been debate about statistics. And I would simply say this. Let's not make the mistake we made at mid-staffs, where we spent four years arguing about the HMSR and shimmy methodologies and we didn't get on with improving care for patients, and we mustn't make that mistake again. And I think when it comes to safety, we are making some really important progress. Earlier this year, we had the first ever global ministerial level patient safety congress in London. Uh, Margaret Chan from the World Health Organization came and she said the WHO will now have a global patient safety day. Uh, Johns Hopkins University a couple of months ago said that uh, medical error was the third biggest cause of death in the United States behind cancer and heart disease, 250,000 deaths a year in the United States alone. And in this country, uh, we have set up the Healthcare Safety Investigation Branch, uh, modeled on the kind of no-blame investigations that the airline industry has. And I'm delighted that the first head of our healthcare safety investigation branch will be Keith Conradi, who has been heading for, I think, the last decade, the air accident investigation branch and knows all about how you do investigations that are designed to be quick, get to the truth, and disseminate knowledge as quickly as possible so that the same mistake isn't made in another part of the system. We have plans for safe spaces legislation so that doctors and nurses can speak openly about mistakes that they've seen or they may have made without having to worry about litigation or um, professional consequences for themselves. Uh, the transparency revolution continues with um, Ofsted star ratings, not just on mental health, but on diabetes, cancer, dementia, learning disabilities, um, and indeed for CCGs themselves. Um, we're also going to be publishing later this year uh, hospitals' own estimates of their avoidable deaths in their own trusts, which will be a, a big step forward. And, you know, it, it is true there is a huge amount to do, but if it seems daunting, just say to yourself, which other healthcare system anywhere in the world is taking a root and branch look at patient safety and trying to transform it across an entire health economy? And that's why I do believe that we can become the safest and highest quality healthcare system in the world if we carry on engaging with this issue in the way that I know all of you are. So I want to say a very big thank you for all that progress that we're making. Um, and I want to talk about the thing that I know is on everyone's mind at the moment, which is money. Now, there is one way in which uh, we perhaps wish we weren't talking about money at the moment, and that is the way that it has intruded into the referendum debate. Let me just say uh, very bluntly that any suggestion that the NHS would see a dividend from leaving the European Union is utterly bogus. The Institute for Fiscal Studies are very, very clear about this, that even if the entire net contribution to the EU, £120 million a week, was given to the NHS, you would only need to see a contraction in GDP of 0.6%, and those benefits would be totally wiped out. And every independent 
forecaster says there will be a huge impact on the economy and many say there will be a recession and many believe that it will be much bigger than 0.6%. Not so much a Brexit dividend as a Brexit hangover as the NHS wakes up with having to cope with yet another recession and we know how damaging that would be because we know that a strong NHS really does need a strong economy. But I don't think I need to tell anyone here that. I think people are worried about the deficits in their own organisations and how we tackle those. And the question that some people ask is, if resources are tight, should I focus on quality and safety? Should I focus on access targets? Or should I focus on tackling my deficit? And I want to suggest to you this morning that that is precisely the wrong question. It is the job of health service managers to deliver high quality safe care that people don't have to wait too long for, that is within the budgets that we have. And I want to go a step further and say that any time that a politician has asked health service managers to focus on one or other of those areas at the expense of the others, the consequences have been absolutely disastrous. It was because we didn't focus enough on quality and safety that we ended up with mid-staffs and problems like mid-staffs all over the NHS. In the decades before that, because we didn't think about access, we had cardiac patients dying on waiting lists before they were treated. And if we don't balance our books and sort out our deficit, the consequence will be cuts to vital NHS services in other parts of the system and a lack of investment to transform services, which is what we all want to see. Uh, good care and good finances are two sides of the same coin. And last year at Confed, I quoted to you uh, the inspirational Gary Kaplan, the chief executive of Virginia Mason Hospital in Seattle, who said that the path to safer care is the same as the path to lower cost. This year, I want to show you some evidence to support that. Um, this is what happens if you look at uh, the CQC ratings, which have now been completed and nearly published for every hospital, and you look at the deficit levels. And you can see that uh, hospitals with an inadequate rating have deficits five times the level of the outstanding hospitals. And that is because, uh, in the end, there is no shortcut. We, we know that about the most expensive thing you can do is to deliver poor care. We know, for example, that an avoidable fall in a hospital will mean that someone will stay in hospital for three days longer, costing about £1,200. We know that a hospital-acquired bed sore will mean someone staying in hospital for around 10 days longer, costing about £2,500. But we also know from this chart that the way to deal with those problems is not to blow your budget on agency staff, um, which very often leads to uh, poor continuity of care and outcomes that are not the best for patients. There is no substitute for tight clinical focus on quality and outcomes, looking at processes and making sure that they are as streamlined as possible and ruthless elimination of waste. And so we have to find a way of balancing our books that is the smart way that improves quality and safety, not the shortcut. And I think there are four areas that need to be focused on if we're going to do this. And the first is the elimination of variation. Let's look at some of the variation that we now know exists as a result, as a result of the, the Carter work. If you look at um, procurement variation, you can see that uh, there is a variation of 23% across the trust that we know, and this is still not all trusts, between the best price, three pounds and nine pence, and the most expensive price, three pounds 81. We are now collecting that information for the 100 most purchased products, and we know that there is savings of around a billion pounds a year from um, trusts moving towards the average and the best prices charged across the NHS. We are the biggest purchaser of healthcare products in the world. 
we should be getting the lowest prices across the system and we should be getting them uniformly. Then there's clinical variation. Uh, Tim Briggs's brilliant work on joint replacement has identified that when a patient gets an infection in a, a hip or knee replacement procedure, that the treatment for that on average costs the NHS £70,000. But how many patients get that? Well, actually, we know that the variation is 3.5%. In some trusts, the infection rates are as low as 0.5%. In others, they go up to 4%. We could pay for 50,000 more hips to be replaced if we eliminated that variation. And there's variation across clinical practice and indeed across management practice, where sickness and absence rates vary by 116%. And if you look at estate costs, of course, there's difference in the, the value of land across the country. But in some trusts, the cost per square meter is just over £100. In other trusts, it's just under £1,000. So eliminating variation is the first thing that we need to focus on. Then something that I know you've been talking about a lot at Confed, which is um, system level change. Uh, this is something that uh, we know works. The stroke reconfiguration in London has been extraordinarily successful in its first two years, saving 22,000 inpatient days, 170 lives. The, the seven-day reconfiguration that Northumbria did, the first hospital in the country to meet the four clinical standards, the health and social care integration that they're planning here in Greater Manchester. These are big changes, and the STP process is designed to make that possible. Um, then thirdly, we need to take a strategic and long-term approach to cost reduction. And that's why the introduction of three-year budgets for providers, which we want to see this year, is going to be very important. And then finally, something that you're going to be hearing about later this morning. If we are going to do this, uh, we need to have an eye to the future and understand the incredible power that modern technology holds in, or in terms of helping us meet these changes. And um, we are very privileged in the NHS to have Professor Bob Wachter of the University of California, San Francisco, possibly the most uh, IT advanced hospital in the world, who is helping us understand what we need to do in the NHS. And Bob is the first person who will say that technology should never be an end in itself. It's a means to higher quality, safer, more efficient care. But he's also uncovering uh, the paradoxes that we have in the UK when it comes to technology. The paradox that uh, we have some of the most advanced electronic records anywhere in the world in our GP network, and yet we have a number of hospitals that still have brown paper files at the end of every patient's bed. We are the country that is in the race to be the first to decode 100,000 genomes. And yet the NHS is reputed to be the biggest purchaser of fax machines in the world. Uh, we do nearly a third of all clinical trials in Europe, in the UK, and yet we read stories of patients not able to access the latest drugs regularly in the papers. And what Bob is going to help us to do, and he'll be presenting his final report at Expo in September, is he's going to help us to understand how we lift our top dozen or so hospitals that have the best uh, IT systems to world-class levels of performance uh, where we are still not at, but then how we take the others uh, who aspire to being world-class and get them into a position uh, where they can uh, have that as a, a realistic and credible explanation. And I don't want to steal his thunder, but I think he's going to say that clinical leadership of IT transformation programs is absolutely vital if we are going to make that a success. So that is why we have to be relentless in our determination to achieve a paperless NHS, one of the more bold promises that I made uh, in 2012, but something that I'm absolutely committed to achieving, because modern technology is going to be crucial in helping us square that circle uh, between access, uh, finance, and quality, which we all know is important. Now, let me just um, conclude by saying this. I, I know 
that this feels an incredibly challenging period. But we should also uh, have some perspective. We aren't alone in the world in facing these challenges. They have doctor strikes in Italy and India. France is coping with a six billion euro deficit in its healthcare system. Many European countries have seen uh, year on year cuts in their health budget. America is still dealing with the after effects of Obamacare. Uh, there are challenges everywhere as we grapple with the challenges of an aging population, but we shouldn't forget what we've achieved. And I just want to leave you with this thought. When I entered Parliament in 2005, there was a lot of turmoil in the NHS. We had a big problem with deficits. We had a big issue with controversial reconfigurations. But you know, when the dust settled at the end of that decade, we had the shortest waiting times in the OECD for elective care and for emergency care. That was an incredible achievement. Now, we also had mid-staffs in that decade, but I hope that decade is remembered as the access decade for the NHS. So what will the verdict of history be on this decade for the NHS? Well, I hope that it is seen as the quality decade. A decade where we made sure that we are delivering safe, high quality care across the system, that we have proper reporting and learning from never events, that we have the reduction and eventual elimination of the vast majority of avoidable harm and death, that we have a seven day NHS with no weekend effect, that we have honesty, transparency and a true learning culture. The quality decade, that is what this decade could be. And to people who say that seems impossible, perhaps I could gently remind you of something that the late great Muhammad Ali said um, as we uh, mourn his, his sad death, when he said impossible is not a fact, it's an opinion. Impossible is not a declaration, it's a dare. Impossible is potential, impossible is temporary, impossible is nothing. What is impossible is to have an NHS where we are not constantly challenged by the media, constantly challenged by science and constantly challenged by our own patients. But what is possible is what every single person in this room wants, which is to have an NHS that offers the safest, highest quality, most efficient care in the world. That is our dream. Let's go for it. Thank you very much. I'm going to scooch closer because otherwise it looks like we're not talking to each other and we've fallen out and we certainly haven't yet. Um, just in the spirit of, of the last slide that you had up, um, it, it talked about honesty, transparency, true learning. In the spirit of that, did you get the junior doctor's negotiation wrong? Did you pick the wrong battle? In a seven-day service, it's not, in your words, the hardest working people that you want to pick on, but it's maybe the consultants that they can't refer up to or the scanners they can't send patients to. Did you just misjudge it catastrophically? Uh, no, um, <laughs> and um, but um, but I will I will you know respond in in the spirit that you've asked. Um, it is absolutely right to say that uh, junior doctors are uh, junior doctors contracts are only a part of what needs to change if we're going to deliver a seven day NHS and. Uh, Consultants' contracts need important changes. Uh, we need to look at uh, the seven-day availability of the social care system, seven-day diagnostic tests, all those things you said. And those are all part of our seven-day plan, and we're making progress on all of them. And it is absolutely right that um, government ministers should uh, prioritise and be clear that they are going to deliver manifesto promises that were made, let's be clear, only uh, one year and one month ago. So, so that was right. I think that uh, along with many people, uh, I had not understood how many other non-contractual issues were a source of great frustration to junior doctors and our junior doctor workforce. And so that's why, uh, regardless of the, the state of um, 
relations with the BMA, I have tried to look at what we can do to improve the lot of junior doctors, to bring back continuity of training, to, um, that's why we talked about e-rostering this morning, um, to, to look at things that are big frustrations like the fact that, uh, you know, they might be posted to work in Sheffield and their partner might be in London. And I think we have to recognise that, um, you know, the six-month rotations uh, pose particular challenges to morale and we can do a lot better as the NHS in terms of supporting our value junior doctor workforce and I hope that's exactly what we'll do. Um, there was a, a, a time when, in certainly the circles that I, I move in, uh, political journalism, there was something called being Lansley, which is where you have then become the story, where Andrew Lansley was the story and every health story was predicated on, on his name. Are you the right man to take these people through some really choppy waters if you have perhaps been landslid, uh, that every story, I mean, you made light of the fact that your unpopularity is, is bad, it's high. Um, why should these people trust you to do it? Well, um, we discussed before that you would have some nice questions for me, Anita, and um, <laughs> you certainly lived up to expectations. I mean, I, I, look, I would say this. Um, I went into politics because I want to change things for the better. And I believe the British public do understand that this government is passionate about improving the safety and quality of care in the NHS and is willing to face up to difficult decisions and challenges. And, and, and the reason I think you're wrong to suggest uh, that we aren't being successful is the evidence that, that I've been showing this morning. We are making I'm very... I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm asking about yeah, you being I the know, man to do but it. I am, happen to be the man who's been in charge uh, during most of the period that we've seen those changes happening. And I think when it comes to safety and quality, we have turned a big corner. I think there's a lot more to do. And I think, you know, the question that uh, you might have to ask yourself if you're um, mistakenly thinking along the lines that uh, you're suggesting is, what is the alternative? Would you rather have a health secretary who didn't take a stand on really important issues of patient safety and patient quality, who wasn't passionate about the NHS being the safest, highest quality service in the world. And I think you do have a choice in politics. You have a choice as to whether you want to be someone who uh, just tries to manage things um, and get by, despite the extraordinary challenges that one has in a system like the NHS, or whether you want to be a politician who wants to change things for the better. And I am in the latter category, and I would say that in the end, that is the best thing for the NHS. Um, and I think we're making the progress that demonstrates that. Well, we're going to take questions from the floor, and I, I would be shocked off my seat if there weren't questions. Uh, the bat people are descending. Um, if you have a question, please put your hand up clearly. They will pass you the mic. Just wait until I call your number, though, before uh, you answer the quest uh, get to ask your question. Um, just while they're, they're sort of sorting all that out. Um, there was a story in the news today about NHS 111 falling down in Devon, Dorset and Cornwall. Uh, CQC report pretty damning indeed. Um, what are you going to do about it? Well, I think the first thing to say is that it is extremely important that we do have the CQC blowing the whistle on these problems quickly and independently, and that's what they did in this case, and that means that the problems are going to be sorted out much more quickly than might have happened in the past, and I know that um, NHS Improvement uh, and NHS England are very focused on, on making the changes that we need. There were some very specific issues in the southwest, um, uh, which came to public attention through the, the tragic death of William Mead, although that was not just 111 that was at fault in that situation. I think the broader question about 111 is whether we are using 111 for its full potential. It's a telephone number that the public find very easy to remember, and as a result of that, we're getting about three times more calls every year than we did to the, to the old NHS Direct. But it's still a service that can be too impersonal. So one of the important changes that's happening this year is that all 111 centres can now access GP medical records so that uh, when someone's speaking to a clinician, they can talk to someone who actually knows their medical history. But I think we could go a lot further than we do. I think 111 is actually one of the big opportunities for the next five years in terms of the, the way we address the urgent and emergency care pressures that we have. 
Let's uh, take a question. Um, number six, first of all, let's go to the back first. And if you could pass the microphone to the people before we get there, that'd be great. It would save the relay race. Thank you. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for your speech. Sandy Brabrook, somewhat retired from the NHS a few years ago, but still connected to it. Um, and I've run the hospitals and primary care trusts. I've covered the whole range of things. My question is IT. Very interested in you say you've got somebody coming in from America who is uh, hospital based. Uh, in my experience, the great disaster was unfortunately uh, by the previous governments, the Labour government with uh, Blair, were to get an integrated healthcare system based it on fancy hospital systems. Whereas if you want an integrated system, I think everybody in this room knows you have to base it on the GP systems and give access because that's where the whole population is registered. Also with your strategy of um, Sir, linking do you have things, a question? It the be question really very simply question. is integration. You need to make sure that information systems are integrated. Is the man from America of that mindset? Well, you must ask the man from America, um, but, uh, but I think he will completely understands that point. And we are, our big asset in this country is actually the fact that GPs completely ignored what the NHS establishment wanted to do 20 years ago and set up their own electronic records that were nothing to do with the NHS centrally. And they are very, very good records. And that is something that is a huge asset for the NHS. So we will effectively be standardising on the GP medical records as the medical record that wends its way across the whole system wherever you go. That's the opportunity, and I completely agree with you, making that record available to ambulance services, 111 services, acute trust, mental health trust, community services, and so on, very, very important. But also, we have a very big job to do inside hospitals, uh, where the potential for IT systems to support a learning culture is absolutely huge, and um, that's what Bob Wachter can help us understand, and uh, indeed his own hospital is a very good example of somewhere that's done that very well. But I think the interesting thing about Bob's work, and the reason that I asked him to help us out, is that he's written a book called The Digital Doctor, which basically is about how all these things go wrong. So this is someone who comes to this wanting to alert us to the problems, we have to be honest, when it comes to IT, America is some way ahead of us, and they've therefore uh, fallen into quite a few traps that we have the benefit of now being able to avoid, and that's where I think he can help us. And, and Bob Boxer will be on straight after this session, so um, just stay uh, where you are. It, it is going to be a very interesting presentation and discussion afterwards. Let's take one from the front, number two. Yeah, thank you, Jeremy. Um, reflecting on your address to us, in STP terms, that seemed very sustainability focused. And I wondered, what is your message to us around transformation? Well, I think transformation um, is very important. And I think uh, the, the STP plans that Simon Stevens is putting in place are going to be uh, very important to do this. Now, I would say, though, that the way that we, there's a way we can get this wrong and a way we can get this right. The way we get this wrong is if people use their STP plans in a time-honoured NHS way to uh, bid for extra pots of money, and then they go on and do what they wanted to do anyway, having put together the business plan that's ticked everyone's boxes. And we're quite good at that in the NHS. Um, but really what the STPs are about is very simply reducing hospital bed days per thousand of population and reducing emergency emissions per thousand of population. And I think the successful SDPs will be the ones that have rigorous data in place that track whether or not the, the many initiatives they're doing are actually reducing hospital bed days and emergency emissions per thousand. The um, £22 billion savings efficiency ask that we have, uh, around £4 billion of that is around demand reduction. That's what we need the SDPs to do. And that rigorous use of data is going to be essential to do that. Thank you. Number four, please. Hello. Thank you, um, Secretary of State. My name is Dr. Singh. I'm a GP in Birmingham and chair of Modality Partnership. I wanted to really follow that question up on STPs. As you know, we've made quite rapid progress in our uh, advance to become uh, the first GP-led ACO in the country. And although our business case, clinical business case, has had major support both locally and nationally, there's a new concern 
and that is the STP process. Is the local STP process, whether it's in Birmingham or other places, going to either stifle the innovation or slow down the level of change that we want to make as an ACO? And I understand the STP is a population-based, health economy-wide, place-based priority plan, but so is an ACO within a smaller population. Um, well, um, I think the person to address that to is the chair of CONFED, who is also the chair of the STP in Birmingham, Stephen Dorrell, my uh, friend and colleague. But I would I'd say I think you've pointed to, to a very important elephant trap that we must avoid. What we don't want is STPs to become bureaucratic structures that inhibit innovation uh, and you are doing a fantastic job at modality and I think it's, it's fascinating what you've achieved. Um, so uh, the, the object is to have ACOs everywhere, a population approach everywhere. Um, I think you can be in the vanguard of what's achieved across Birmingham um, and it would be very exciting if, if you could help Birmingham become one of the most successful STPs and I'm sure that's your plan. Uh, question from the front, number three. Thanks very much. Uh, Julia Ross from PI, Care and Health. We uh, integrate and analyse data. So my question is reflects two of the previous questions. It's about STPs. And how do you see uh, the use of data across health, social care, housing, uh, as well as just in the NHS, being able to take STPs forward? Um, and also, I guess, a bit of a challenge on what's happening nationally, because you showed us a lot of useful slides and charts, but a lot of that data was going back to 2015, uh, 14, 15. Why isn't it possible, or is there a, do you have plans to take further leadership for looking at that on a national basis? Thank you. Um, if I understood the, the data, um, I think that having more timely data is very important, and I think one of the things we have to do in our data collections, which actually we're starting to do uh, with the changes that are happening at the Health and Social Care Information Centre, soon to be named NHS Digital, is actually moving to much more monthly and quarterly data. Because I think the trouble with annual data with a two or three month time lag is that uh, you don't see it uh, when you change things in the next month or the next two months reflected in the numbers, and, and that's not helpful. So um, I, I definitely agree with you on that. With respect to health and social care integration and uh, the data, one of the things that I um, think is very important that CCGs deliver is um, whole person costs for each of the members of the population that they deliver, uh, capitated costs so that a CCG can talk about the total health and social care cost of every single person for whom they're responsible. Because I think it's only when you know those costs, and that needs a good IT system, um, that you are able to make smart commissioning decisions. And then when you do that, of course you start to open up the possibility of uh, much more intelligent discussions with councils about things like housing, because you find that, you know, of the people, the few people who are costing you more than £25,000 a year, a number of them have a housing problem that could be sorted out for a fraction of that cost. And that's where we need to head to, which is, I hope, what the STP process will allow. Um, we are up against the clock. Unfortunately, the Secretary of State has to dash back to London, and I know the train that you're booked on. For security reasons, I'm not telling any of you. Um, but uh, just my last question to you. Um, is it a perception issue, but it does seem as if Simon Stevens is going to speak rather a lot to number 11 Downing Street. Is the Treasury trampling a little bit on your territory? Um, another friendly, uh, warm question from you, Anita. Uh, no, I mean... Actually, Simon and I uh, negotiated the spending review together, um, and uh, Simon came in towards the end, um, and we work as a team on all of these things. Uh, we all understand, Simon understands that, to deliver the five-year forward view, uh, we have to deal with the issue of financial discipline and deficits, otherwise we won't have the funding that we need uh, to roll out these very exciting plans, which we've been talking about this morning. Um, but he also understands, we also understand that we have to operate within the national financial picture that we have if we're going to have the strong economy that we'll need for sustained forward funding of the NHS. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, these are the talks that really do fill the auditorium. You can see how important what you have to say uh, is to the people gathered here. Please join with me in thanking the Secretary of State for Health, Mr Jeremy Hunt.